I'm curious to get your take on the origins of vegetable oils and when did these start to creep into the food supply and what did we start to see change after they started to become more pervasive? Yeah, so, well, with the first principles, so that the root cause is oxidative stress and vegetable oils promote oxidative stress by two means, right? They are both capable of generating toxicity um, and we see, uh, you know, rates of diseases correlating with their introduction into the food supply starting in the early 1900s. And we see rates of diseases accelerating um, as they increased in the food supply. Um, and they uh, really kind of took off in the 1950s. And there was another big increase um, since the year 2000. And they're promoting oxidative stress by causing uh, cellular toxicity and um, they are nutrient poor. So both of those things make it very difficult for our cells to be healthy. And like the first principle that I talk about in chapter two of dark calories is that health begins at the level of the cell. And it's a first, first principle kind of means something that it's really hard to argue against. Like it's, it's, it's uh, something that is already well-established or should be well-established depending on the state of the science with medical science. It's not well established, but it should be. I think it, you know, eventually would stand up to the test of time because it's a common sense. If you are, if you have only healthy cells, all the cells in your body are healthy, you're not going to get sick. You could get an infection, but you're going to fight it off as well as you can. You can get squashed by a piano if you're a wily coyote running around uh, the Southwest. Um, that would be the end of you. But, uh, but, um, you know, there's still, you can still die, but it's not going to be a chronic disease. So chronic disease can't happen when you have fully healthy cells. And on the other hand, if your cells are always experiencing oxidative stress, then you can't be healthy and some sort of disease, disease is inevitable. So how does this tie us now? How does this take us to becoming overweight? Well, that was a question that um, I didn't really have an answer to until I saw two very important and fascinating pieces of evidence and started thinking about those and sort of putting like a hypothesis together. Mm. So one, one piece of evidence, um, well, obviously we are eating more vegetable oils now. I think I covered that, right? At the beginning of the, of the 1900s, we got maybe three calories a day because they basically didn't exist in the food supply. And now we're getting... 400, 500, 600 calories a day on average in America. Yeah, three ounces, wow. you know, 80% um, of our fat calories, 30% of our uh, total calories. That equates to around, you know, four, five, six, 700, depending on how many calories you're getting. Um, and so that's a big difference, right? So these things, first of all, they correlate with health problems. And uh, that doesn't mean, they are causational, but it, it does, if there is no correlation, you can't have a causation. Um, and I want to return to that idea, but because mm -hmm. of some things that are in the conversation right now about um, sugar, which we've actually mm -hmm. started eating less of in the past 20 years, yet we've been getting more obese. So, so, uh, so that's, so I guess I'll just dive into right now, like of all the common food elements, the ones that correlate the best are the most likely suspects for actually being playing a more important role in the obesity and metabolic disease epidemics, right? The right. ones that correlate best, right? So, so saturated fat, butter, zero correlation, not a problem. Salt, that's often, you know, blamed for lots of diseases, hypertension, um, but we aren't truly eating significantly more salt than ever before. Uh, we are eating significantly more of these vegetable oils. Um, we're, however, we are not really eating a lot more uh, sugar and carbohydrates since the year 2000, right? Um, since the year 2000, our consumption of fructose has declined something like 60%, so very significant. And our total um, sugar, added sugar consumption has declined a little bit, uh, something like, uh, I think it's between three and 10%. And similar declines in our total carbohydrates, I think, thanks in part to all the popularity of the keto diets and the high protein diets and, you know, those, uh, the carnivore diet, stuff like that. So making, it's making a dent in the carbohydrate consumption, yet not yet a dent in our health. We are still having the same 
acceleration, really, worse year over year, more obesity, more heart attacks, cancers developing in younger people. So the correlate the, the thing that correlates best is vegetable oils. And since you you could say, and I would argue that because carbohydrates don't correlate with what's been going on for the past 20 years, they should be not they should be considered a lesser factor. Mm. If a factor at all, well, certainly there's some factor there, but, um, but a, a lesser factor. So, so that is the, the sort of like the basic, um, common sense, numerical, graphical data level of analysis that hasn't been done. I just, I haven't really seen too many other people pick up on that. Um, mm. I, you know, I published a graph similar to that in my 2017 book, The Fat Burn Fix. I've seen a couple other people publish similar things since then, but certainly it's not catching on in medicine and it's not really catching on in the keto community because they haven't noticed that the carbohydrate consumption is level or, or heading down. Um, so, so we, so that's that first layer of evidentiary like value. But getting back to the first principles, um, the um, the root cause of the the metabolic disease. So one of the studies that really helped me understand what's going on came from Dr. Stefan Guyane, who published mm -hmm. an article somewhere around 2011 on his blog first, and um, he showed that polyunsaturated fats in human body fat have increased significantly since we started collecting that sort of data um, in a reliable way, which was like the 1950s and 60s back then. And, and does that, does that like resonate with anybody? So I kind of define that. What is that? That, totally. that, that come from seed oils. Yeah. So the poly, I think it would be a good, good point to just point out that polyunsaturated fat, linoleic acid, like this is what's found in seed oils. And you're saying over the past several decades, we've seen a, a rise in actually human uh, fat that's in our cells um, as it relates to these polyunsaturated fats. Correct. In our fat cells, so in wow. our fat cells under our skin, right? And so and this is being- Visceral fat. This is being stored in our fat and it stays- I think the research says it stays in our bodies for something like 350 days or, or something like that. The half life half life of linoleic acid is like above 350 days, which you can the half life of this. Yeah. So the half life, I don't believe we have specific for linoleic acid data, and it might be less for um, the polyuns, all the polyunsaturates, but the half life for just triglyceride fat uh, is what I believe was measured. And, um, that is on the order of exactly what you said. And uh, that means, you know, you need about three half lives to clear something out more or less. So it would take three, four years to clear it all out. Um, so, but yeah, so what that means is that our diets have changed the composition of our body fat because of these seed oils. And I have to emphasize that, yes, linoleic acid is the dominant one, but it's not the most problematic. So thank God it's not the other way around where we have more omega-3 fat, that mm -hmm. our problems would be worse. And wow. I talk about that in, in um, chapter one of Dark Calories, where I talk about um, why omega-3 is actually less stable. And uh, you know the solution to our imbalance is not eating more omega-3 by far. And both of them are toxic and linoleic acid is not as toxic as, as the um, omega-3 in terms of oxidative stress. So for this discussion, I want to focus on polyunsaturates and not just linoleic acid. Mm. Um, yeah. So, um, so all that polyunsaturated fat in our body fat has been building up. Okay. So that was one piece of data, this graph that shows that back around uh, 1950s, uh, PUFA in our body fat. PUFA stands for polyunsaturated fats. Um, PUFA in our body fat was around 5 to 10%. And at the end of Stefan Guyane's data collection period in around 20, 2005, um, it was somewhere between 20 and 30%. Like there was a range depending on what people ate. Wow. So, but a significantly higher. 
that is a significant change to the chemical composition of the largest organ in our body. And again, the obesity experts don't know this. They're not mentioning it. Nothing, not a word mentioned about vegetable oil in any of the obesity conferences that I've either attended or looked over the syllabi for mm. nothing, not a word. Um, so, so that means there's something very different about our body fat right now. And long story short, I'm just going to jump to the chase here. What it is, is we can build body fat, but because our body fat now has so much PUFA, it doesn't generate energy. Uh, properly. It's not a good fuel for our mm -hmm. mitochondria. And our mitochondria are the agents of metabolic health or metabolic disease because they generate energy and energy is uh, necessary to uh, life. And um, metabolic health comes down to being able to generate energy, clean energy, without generating oxidative stress, which causes inflammation. So our body fat now generates oxidative stress and inflammation, and we can, we can build it like normal, but when we try to burn it, our cells will experience more oxidative stress and inflammation. Wow. So even if, you know, someone's starting to make dietary changes where they're eliminating seed oils and vegetable oils from their diet, they're going to have in theory, based on this empirical data, higher levels of PUFAs stored in their fat cells. So they still might be going through a period of like a deep, I almost don't even want to say detox, but as their body is, you know, burning off that fat that was stored. And then, um, you know, in theory, not, not eating any more vegetable oils, they're still going through a process of oxidative stress as that fat is burning off. Somewhat, yes. And so that is why I think rapid weight loss um, really sets people up for problems hmm. uh, because they're forcing their bodies to use more of this body fat than their body naturally would do if they weren't kind of suppressing their appetite with Ozempic or something like that. Right. Yeah. And, and that's causing cellular damage. And I think we're going to end up seeing a backlash from all these folks who are taking Ozempic and losing weight, um, but not paying attention to vegetable oils, not fortifying their bodies against the onslaught of oxidative stress, which you can and need to do. And I talk about how to do that in dark calories mm. um, They're but they're not doing that. They're just losing weight, any old eating, any old thing that they want most of them. And I think in about five, 10 years, we're going to unfortunately see an epidemic, a new epidemic of strange diseases, autoimmune diseases, perhaps cancers. Um, I don't know what, but I don't think it's going to be good um, because it's dangerous to be forcing people to burn off that body fat. Mm. 